All right, welcome back. How was the coffee? No one had coffee, you had tea. Okay, all right. So um, at this point, we are gonna speak about the role of symmetries, which is a very important role for the TMD uh, distributions. Um, and also we're gonna see the role of spin. And in particular, we're gonna speak about the definition of single spin asymmetries, which is in the title of this lecture. Um, all right, okay. So let's focus first of all on the gauge symmetry. Okay, QCD is a gauge theory. So it's invariant under gauge transformation with the group S two three. okay? So the idea of factorization is the following. You have a gauge invariant observable, oops, sorry. You have a cross section, which is observable, so it's a gauge invariant quantity. And we decompose it as a product or a convolution, whatever, uh, of terms, which represents different physics, okay, different energy scales, different time scales, who are also, which are also gauge invariant, okay? So the hard part, which describes the hard interaction between the photon, the quarks, the associated gluons, the hadron structure part, the correlation functions that define the PDFs, and the hadronization part, which is also non-perturbative uh, in part as the hadron structure part that contains the fragmentation function. So as I said, the cross-section is observable, so it's a gauge invariant quantity, and we also, and the idea is to decompose the cross-section in, in, uh, in terms of gauge invariant terms. Um, okay, let's look at the quark correlator the phi that sits here, okay? So the correlation function that defines hadron structure, that encodes hadron structure. Is this gauge invariant? No, it's not gauge invariant because the psi bar psi operator does not transform into itself under gauge transformation. So a gauge transformation has the following form, okay? It's local, so it depends on X eh, in the phase. So psi bar psi transforms into psi bar u dagger u psi. This u dagger u is not equal to one because it's evaluated at two different points. So we need to correct this expression and we have to some, so the idea you already see is to somehow close the non-locality between zero and psi to make the operator gauge invariant. Okay, so how do you do it? You, you use a Wilson line or a gauge link to close the non-locality and make the operator gauge invariant. So let's go back to this drawing that I showed you in the first lecture. So the idea to close the non-locality is to use an operator that transports psi bar into psi or vice versa. So this operator can be obtained by solving the parallel transport equation uh, for, uh, in, for the case of QCD. So you calculate what does it mean trans parallel transport. You have to transport this field along the path in a parallel way. Parallel way means that the covariant derivative has to be zero along the path, okay? The covariant derivative contains also the gluon field, not the standard derivative and the gluon fields, okay? And so it, exactly as I said, so this field is transported into the space that sits attached to xi, keeping the covariant derivative equal to zero. This is, a, I mean, it, I didn't invent it, of course, it's, it's, um, uh, it's sitting in, in the geometry books of gauge theories and theories like general relativity. The solution of this parallel transport equation is a path ordered exponential. It's the so-called, the operator that X on psi at the point X of zero is the so-called gauge link is the operator that transports psi from this point to the other one. So I invite you as a, as a homework to check this expression. So Barbara addressed this uh, expression also in her lecture this morning. So um, actually she, she explained you what the path ordered uh, uh, operator means. Um, so if you want, I think it's an instructive exercise to do it. Then maybe we can discuss it together later on. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not complicated. So this is one way to think about the gauge link. Uh, other ways to think about the gauge links come from the factorization theorems. They tell you exactly how to get this operator from the point of view of perturbation theory. But I believe this is quite intuitive. Um, 
okay, once you include this gauge link here operator, uh, uh, u between zero and psi, u uh, that transports the vectors from zero to psi, between psi bar and psi, this operator here is gauge invariant. And why is it so? Because the gauge link transforms in this way, um, where, where curly u is the gauge transformation. So if you do the math, you see that psi bar u psi transforms into psi bar u psi. So it's invariant. So we are in business. Um, let's look. So we, we, are now, we are now happy, which is that it's gauge invariant. But let's look at the equation here. So as Barbara mentioned, you can give a physical interpretation to this operator as an infinite sum of uh, gluon exchanges. So if you perform, uh, if you expand in a, in, in a series the exponential, what is the first term in the expansion? It's one, okay? So if you exp uh, expand in powers of G, you will gonna have identity plus a term that goes like G, then you're gonna have G square, that you're gonna have g to the cube, and so on and so forth. So this corresponds to not having a gluon exchange, then to having a gluon exchange between the, the blob and whatever is up. Then you have two gluons, then you have three gluons, and so on and so forth. So it's an infinite towers of gluons that are exchanged. And the definition of the PDF in the diagrammatic way is modified. You see that it's not really the handbag diagram anymore. There is a, a double line here with the exchange of gluons that represents the fact that you have a Wilson line and the operator is gauge invariant. So, okay, let's leave it here. Okay, this is gauge invariant and we understand what the gauge link means from the physical point of view. The fact that you have a gauge link has some consequences, profound consequences, especially for the field of TMD physics, because the, uh, uh, the gauge link can be built using any path in space-time to connect zero and psi. So the PDFs, in principle, get a path dependence, okay? You can go between zero and psi in any way you want, but the physics tells you that actually there are only some specific paths that emerge in reality when you factorize a, a cross-section in terms of TMDs. And we are gonna see later which are these paths. Okay, at this point, let's consider, let's consider uh, the role of parity and time reversal. So parity, if you have a space-time uh, point, like a mu, a vector, what does parity do? It changes the spatial components. Okay, so let's, let's consider this definition. Let's consider a tilde, like the vector a, with the uh, spatial components, uh, uh, with the opposite spatial components. Let's add a minus sign there. So this is what happens for momenta, for the spin, and for the light cone basis vectors. So as we said, z, uh, z goes to z tilde, and the same happens for momenta. The spin instead does not change. Why is it so? Spin goes, s goes to s. Why, why does, is the spin, uh, does the spin not change under parity? Yeah, it's, a, it's, an, orbit, it's an, an angular momentum, right? So it's, you can think about it as our position uh, cross P momentum. So they both change sign in the spatial part. So S stays the same. So we indicate it, we can also write it as minus S tilde because the, the, the energy component here is zero. Okay, if you, if you check, n plus goes to n minus. These are the light cone basis vectors. And n minus goes to n plus under parity. And then there are these transformation laws for the spinners and the Dirac matrices. So where do they come from? They come from the fact that the Lagrangian, the QCD Lagrangian is invariant under parity. Okay, so this is the form. C trans, psi transform as this parity uh, operator um, which amounts to a specific Dirac matrix acting on Psi and the Dirac matrix, the form of the Dirac matrix is, is just gamma zero, okay? And also the Dirac matrix gamma mu transforms in this way. Okay, but these equations, keep in mind, they come from the fact that the QCD Lagrangian is invariant under parity. 
And something similar happens for time reversal. Okay, time reversal amounts to inverting only the time component. So z goes to minus z tilde. So you change only the time component. Again, parity goes to, sorry, momentum goes to uh, p tilde, s goes to s tilde, n plus goes to minus n minus, and n minus goes to minus n plus. So you switch n plus and minus and you invert the sign. And there is a similar transformation law for the spinners and the gamma matrices, which comes again from the fact that the QCD Lagrangian is invariant under time reversal, okay? Um, all right, so these are the tools that you can use to work out the symmetry properties for the TMDs and the correlation functions. We are gonna use them later. So let's go back to the question um, of the uh, process dependence of the TMDs. So half an hour ago, I was asking you, are you worried by a PDF that depends on the process? And you were all worried about that scenario. And you were right because Hadron structure should not uh, depend on the way you look at the specific, uh, you look at the Hadron, it should not depend on the, the ways of the process that you use to probe um, a specific target. So if the PDF depends on the gauge link and the gauge link is arbitrary, then we are lost. If the gauge link is not arbitrary, but has some specific form, and these forms are related to each other, then we can recover some sort of generalized universality. So the TMDs are not univer completely universal as, as the PDFs are, but they have generalized universality. So the non-universality part can be calculated, actually. So you recover some sort of universality property. So let's go back to uh, the gauge link picture. So the path between zero and psi, if you look just at the operator can be whatever. But if the operator comes from the factorization theorem of a specific process, the path is not whatever you want. It has to be, it has to be something very specific. Okay, let's consider the case of Drellian. In Drellian, so if you consider, this is like the Feynman amplitude in a cartoonish way. In Drellian, um, the, the gluons in the gauge link corresponds to gluon scatterings, so interactions between the remnant of one proton in the initial state, which is colored because you remove the quark from the proton, so the remnant is colored, okay, with the colored quark in the other leg of the process in the, in the, in the initial state. So the quark here is colored, the remnant is colored, so they exchange the gluon, okay. So, these interactions can be resumed into what is the gauge link for Trellian. And the defactorization the theorem for this observable tells you that the path in space time goes along the light cone minus component to minus infinity. Then it bridges the non-locality in the transverse direction in this way, and then it goes back to psi. So it has what is called a staple form. Okay? It's a staple that goes to minus infinity. So we 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 label this path in space time with a minus sign. So this gauge link, we call it the U minus gauge link. So the distribution functions that we use in Drellian depend on the gauge link with the path that goes to minus infinity. What happens for another process like semi-inclusive DIS? Here the remnant, which is colored, interacts with the quark in the final state. So this difference between CDs and Drellian, so the fact that the remnant talks to the quark in the future in the Feynman diagram, makes the path different with respect to the Drellian case. So in this case, the path goes to, again, the light con minus component, but to plus infinity rather than minus infinity. So it goes to plus infinity in this direction, it bridges the non-locality, and then it goes back to psi. So basically, if you, if you look, I think it's gonna be the next slide, but let's draw it here. So, this is the minus direction, this is the transverse direction, this is zero, this is psi. In Drellian, something like this happens. Okay, you go to minus infinity. In semi-inclusive DIS, it's the opposite. You go to plus infinity in this direction, you close the non-locality, and you go back to psi. And we label this U plus, okay? So eventually you always go from zero to psi, but you use two different paths, okay? I was talking to some of your fellows here. Um, 
these are the paths that emerge in CD Central LDN. And as far as I know, there are no processes that you can factorize with a gauge link that uses a straight line between zero and sign. I don't think there is, a, there is a process with such a structure. These are the two paths that emerge for semi-inclusive DIS and Relian, which are two out of the three uh, processes that can be factorized with TMDs in a standard way. So, okay, this is what I draw. Um, for semi-inclusive DIS, you have the future pointing, and uh, for Relian, you have the past pointing gauge link. For collinear PDFs, this is not a problem. Why? Collinear PDFs, they don't depend on KT. So the fact that you integrate this, that these functions are integrated over KT means that the non-locality in the transverse position is closed. So you, you have to imagine that you have to squeeze this picture in this way. So you, 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 you send the two curves at xi t equal to zero. So U minus and U plus, if you, if you close this uh, rectangle here, they boil down to the same thing. They boil down to an arrow that goes from zero to psi in both cases. So there is no difference between U plus and U minus anymore if you close the non-locality in the transverse direction. So you see the gauge link in the collinear case becomes trivial and then you can even make equal to the identity matrix with the by setting A plus equal to zero as uh, Barbara Pasquini showed you this morning. So in the collinear case, the gauge link is irrelevant, okay? But if you open, if you have transverse momentum dependence and you open the non-locality in the transverse space, then you have different paths and potentially the distributions are different. Okay, so this is the question. So the hard process determines the path of the link and then the distributions are process dependent. In a sense, we lose the universal concept of a concept of universal hadron structure. Um, but there is a way out, and I want you, I want you, I want to show you what happens uh, in a very specific case, which is the case of the Sievers function. So, if you take your TMD correlation function and you calculate the projection of this correlation function with uh, the gamma plus matrix, so you take uh, the trace of this object here and with uh, uh, capital gamma equal to gamma plus, you obtain specifically two functions. So in the unpolarized case, if your nucleon is unpolarized, you only have the unpolarized pardon distribution function. If you have a, trans if you have a spin, you also have the Sievers function, which is the spin dependent term here, okay? It's this one. Uh, so you see that I added a gauge link dependence to these functions. You can probe them in different processes. Each process has a different path. Each path corresponds to a different gauge link. So also the distributions are different. So the solution of this puzzle is the following. By mixing time reversal invariance with gauge invariance, there is a very nice, um, say, accident that basically let let's some of these distributions like the unpolarized distribution be the same. And these are the so-called time reversal even distributions. So these functions here are the same between the plus and minus configuration. So they are the same between Drellian, uh, uh, semi inclusive DIS and Drellian. Or they get a minus sign by switching process. So the PD, the Sievers TMD distribution in semi inclusive DIS has to be According to the symmetries of QCD, it has to be the Sievers TMD PDF that you use in Drellian times a minus sign. So this is a striking prediction of the symmetries of QCD. It's something which is crucial. It's, it's a minus sign, but it's very, very important. Um, and this, the Sievers function, um, uh, so it's, uh, it belongs to a class of functions that because of this relation is called Tiot distributions, are called Tiot distributions. Um, in this sense, we recover a generalized universality because the process dependence can be calculated. It's not that these relations are, these functions are not related. So we know that these are different, but there is a relation between the two. So that's why we say there is a generalized universality in the case of TMD, because we recover a relation which is calculable. And it's also simple, it's a minus sign. 
But since this is a, a, um, a consequence of the symmetries of QCD, since, and it's not a consequence of an assumption that you make in a model calculation, it's something that is extremely important. And a, a big share of the experimental program in QCD is actually to confirm experimentally this sign change relation. So my colleagues can comment further on this, but this is one of the, um, I would say it's one of the milestones for the QCD program, the experimental QCD program. Um, imagine, imagine what it would happen if some experiment determines that this is not true. It would be a disaster because it comes directly from the symmetries of QCD. Okay? Of course, before claiming experimentally that this is violated, one should check, I mean, everything, right, in, in, in your experimental setup or in the errors of the phenomenological analysis that determines these kind of relations. But the point I want to, the point I want to make and what I want you to remember from this lecture is that this is one of the most important relations in QCD that should be uh, confirmed experimentally. And it's not confirmed experimentally yet, okay? Okay, so uh, at this point, I want to go to the blackboard and I think it's instructive to uh, understand how this sign change relation emerges uh, for the Sievers function. Okay, so these are the uh, the way the gauge links change under hermeticity, parity, and time reversal. So um, if you apply time reversal transformation to a gauge link, this are, we are not gonna prove this, but so the last one is the relation which is important for us now. If you, if you apply time reversal to the gauge link, you see that the plus configuration, the plus gauge link, so the future pointing transforms into the past pointing. So plus goes into minus and minus goes into plus. This is the important thing. For parity, that's not the case, okay? For parity, the plus gauge link goes into plus. The minus goes into minus. This prevents you, fr prevents you from having, in this case, terms which are with change sign under parity, for example. So um, you, only have, you only have time reversal odd and not parity odd contributions in this scenario because of this relation. Okay, so um, one, so the, the, the relations you should check, I believe it's quite instructive uh, to get some, to do some gymnastics with the gamma matrices are this one, so the time reversal properties uh, for the gauge link and the time reversal transformation for the TMD correlation function or the, the, the in general, the distribution functions. So you see that in this case, you apply time reversal to uh, a correlator with the plus gauge link and it becomes a correlator with the minus gauge link. Okay, let's see, let's see what happens for the distribution functions. I don't think we need the camera, otherwise we would have to switch between one and the other, between the, the, the screen and the camera. It's gonna be quick actually. Um, so let's let's go back to let's go back to this. Okay, let's keep in mind let's keep in mind that um, in the time reversal case. This is what happens to the correlation function. You have correlation function of K, P, S, and the like basis and plus and minus. Complex conjugates, this is equal to um, pa, 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 I gamma one, gamma three. Can you see? Phi of K tilde, P tilde, S tilde, and N plus minus prime. Okay, so the tilde are the vectors with the spatial component, uh, with the opposite spatial component. Prime means that I'm just changing these vectors under time reversal. And you have I, gamma one, gamma three. And on top of this, let's add the gauge link dependence. So plus, 
goes into minus and minus goes into plus. So this is what happens to time reversal. Ah, but I need, I need a slide. <laughs> okay, but I can, don't worry. And prime is uh, the vector transformed. I just, I mean, it's, and plus is minus and minus, and then minus is minus and plus. I just wanted to remind that the, the also the other correlator, the correlator on the right needs to be calculated with the, uh, and with a minus sign. Okay. Uh, five minutes. No, 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 I'm just gonna use it now and then I switch back to, yeah. Okay. You, you can keep it this way, it's fine. Don't worry, don't worry, let's do it this way. Okay. Okay, so I will, I will show like the most important steps and then I invite you to try to repeat this calculation by yourself and maybe we can cross check it at the boards also later on. So let's consider the unpolarized. If you project these equations with the gamma plus and you consider the unpolarized case, you have the following. So projecting means that you trace the left hand side with gamma plus, okay, and you do the same here. Let's put the gamma plus here. Okay, I want to project out the gamma plus structures to get the unpolarized TMD and the Sievers TMD PDF. And I also have to integrate on the suppressed momentum components um, on both sides. But yeah, the steps are a little long. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna do it here. Let me just tell you what I get at the end of the day. If I don't consider the spin, I have the trace of gamma plus one over four, the unpolarized TMD PDF x k t square n plus slash, which is the direct structure associated to F1. Okay, and let's add the gauge link dependence. Let me add it here, plus or minus. Okay. This is equal to the trace of, again, gamma plus, then you have I, gamma one, gamma three, one over four, F one, X K T square, with the other gauge links, minus plus, N plus prime, I, gamma one, gamma three. Okay. So, now you can uh, do a uh, cyclic permutation of the arguments of the trace. This I gamma one, gamma three, they leave from this side and they come back from this other side. So here you have, uh, um, let's go, let me, let me write that equation again here. You have the trace of gamma plus one over four, F1 plus minus and plus slash. And then you have the trace of I gamma one, gamma three, gamma plus I gamma one, gamma three. And then you have N plus slash prime one over four F1 with the opposite gauge links. Okay, so this guy is, if you look at the transformation properties of the gamma matrices, is nothing else than gamma plus in the transformed uh, under the time reversal transformations. So you can also convince yourself that the trace of gamma plus and n slash plus is equal to the trace of gamma plus prime with n, n slash plus prime. So 
you can take out whatever is not the Dirac object from the trace, and you have one over four F1 plus minus with this trace, gamma plus and plus slash, and you have one over four F1 minus plus, okay, with a trace which is the same but with the primed objects. Okay, so these traces are actually the same. If you look at the transformation properties of the gamma and the n vectors, so these are actually the same. So whatever you're left of is the following. You're left with the fact that F1 x kt square plus is equal to F1 x kt square minus. So you show that the unpolarized TMD PDF is the same with the two different gauge ring configuration. Okay, so it's a t-even function. So let's look at the case of the Sievers function instead. That's a little bit more complicated because you have a spin-dependent structure. Okay, so I can either erase here or there. Okay, for the Sievers case, you have something like this. So let's project again with the gamma plus, but let's consider the spin dependent part. So we have the trace gamma plus with the spin dependent part of the correlator for the gamma plus projection. Yeah. It's uh, one uh, T herp, let's say with the plus gauge link, the Sievers function, x of t square, and then the Dirac structure is n plus, and epsilon mu nu alpha beta, n plus mu, n minus mu, transverse spin alpha, transverse momentum beta, okay? And this is equal to, if you look at the master equation there, you have gamma plus, herp with the minus, then you have the transformation matrices, acting on n plus prime, gamma one, gamma t. Uh, then you still have the levy beta part, n plus mu prime and minus mu prime. Then you have s tilde t alpha, k t tilde No, 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 I just want to see, okay, yeah, thank you, okay, okay, all right, so let's try to see what happens. We have, if you, if we go on here, We take out whatever does not, whatever is not a Dirac object, so one over two m and the Sievers function, and then you're left with this trace. So uh, let me see. You have um, yeah, the trace. Uh, this is the trace of gamma plus 
uh, gamma plus, okay, so you can rewrite gamma plus as I did before using the transformation matrices, gamma plus uh, prime, okay, so you leave, you let this one leave from the right and come back from the left, so this becomes gamma plus prime, then you have n plus slash prime, and then you have epsilon mu alpha beta, so n plus prime becomes n minus mu with a minus sign. Let's, let's count the minus sign. I have a minus sign here. Then I have another minus sign coming from the fact that n minus becomes n plus. Okay, so this becomes squared. S tilde uh, become this, uh, so I get, wait a second, yes, st alpha and kt beta give me two other minus signs. So I have a power of four in total, so no minus sign up to now. Okay, okay, so let me, let me put the parentheses here because these are not direct indexes. Okay, so this is the trace of gamma plus prime and plus slash prime. And I want to have a Dirac structure, sorry, a Lorentz structure that resembles what I had in the beginning. See, so this one, let me, let me write it as gamma plus n plus slash, uh, and then I had one over two m, the sievers with uh, the plus page link. Okay, and then I had epsilon mu nu alpha beta. Mu nu alpha beta, n plus mu, n minus mu, ft alpha, kt beta. Okay, so that these traces we said are the same, this one and this one, but let's go on. n minus mu, n plus nu, st alpha, kt beta, okay. So if these two are the same, you can just get rid of them. And you have one, two, f1, t perp with the minus page link. So in order to match these two expressions, you see that you have n plus contracting with mu and then n minus contracting with the uh, uh, new index. Here I have the opposite, so I have to switch basically mu and nu, and this is an anti-symmetric tensor, and it can give me a minus sign. So if I want to recover that structure over there, I have to switch mu and nu, and that gives me a minus sign, okay? And then I can simplify everything else, because the contraction between uh, and, uh, minus plus st and kt becomes the same. So by interchanging mu and nu, I get that f1t perp is equal to minus f1t perp minus. Let's take a moment, yes, yes. Because of the anti-symmetric nature of this term here, that implements the vector product between kt and st, we get a minus sign for the Sievers function. So, this is a direct prediction of the symmetries of QCD by the fact that I combine together time reversal and gate symmetry. So it has to be true, otherwise there is something wrong in the symmetries of QCD. Okay, yeah, let's go back to the Yes. Thank you. Okay. I think I have to click on the, yeah, let's try. Ah, no, no wait. I don't know.
It's working. Thank you. Okay. So, how can we make sense of this relation experimentally? We try to measure. We try to measure the Sievers function. We try to measure it simultaneously, simultaneously between processes like Drelian and Cedis, where there is a sign change from the theory point of view, and we see if we really need this minus sign to, uh, for the simultaneous descriptions of Cedis and Drelian. So, let's talk about first uh, single spin asymmetries briefly. So, single spin asymmetries are quantities which are basically defined as ratios of cross sections with different polarization. So the Sievers function emerges when you transversely polarize your hadron. Okay, so in order to get it experimentally, you will have to work with polarized hadrons. Um, one way to get to objects like the Sievers function is to calculate this asymmetry, which is called a sub n. So you take the difference between the cross section with the proton transversely polarized in the up direction minus the cross section with the proton transversely polarized in the down direction, and you divide by the sum. Okay, so um, people started doing this way, way, way before knowing about the Sievers function. Okay, so uh, as Abe explained, um, uh, whatever was dealing with spin in the context of perturbative QCD was not considered like, I don't know, uh, something very correct. Um, the idea is that, for example, in 1976, uh, the first experiment that measured this kind of asymmetry at uh, Argonne National Laboratory uh, for the production of two pions out of a proton-proton collision was of the order of 20, 30, 40%, 50%, so something huge, you see. It's a gigantic asymmetry. And it's a left-right asymmetry, as the cartoon shows you. So you have a proton which is incoming in this way, the, the spin is, is pointing up, and you measure an asymmetry left-right with respect to the plane identified by the spin. Okay, so you measure more pions going in, in, in that way and more pi plus in this way and pi minus on the other way. And the same thing was measured in 1991 at Fermilab, uh, same huge asymmetry at Brookhaven National Lab in the 2000, in 2002, and at RIC in 2008. So there is no way to make sense of this expression in perturbative QCD, because if you calculate this observable in perturbative QCD collinear factorization without knowing about non-perturbative transverse momentum effects, you only get something which is proportional to alpha strong times the mass of the quark, so two small things, divided by another big thing, which is the square root of s. So this is tiny, and it's much, much smaller than what you observed experimentally. So here you really need a different mechanism, something which is non-perturbative, and it's related to orbital angular momentum or transverse momentum in general. So I invite you to check this review, uh, which is pretty nice. It's, it's from 2015, so it's not super recent, but it has a nice overview of uh, uh, this kind of asymmetries in proton-proton collision. Okay. So, um, one way to measure the Sievers function is to look, as I said, at the process of semi inclusive DIS and Relian with asymmetries that are constructed more or less in this way. So, let's see. If I consider semi inclusive DIS with a polarized target, I need to polarize the target in, the, in a transverse direction, otherwise, I don't get the Sievers function. I can construct an asymmetry with an unpolarized lepton beam, a transversely polarized target, and a signal that has this kind of azimuthal modulation, the sign of the difference of the, between the angle, the azimuthal angle of the hadron and the azimuthal angle of the spin, which is related, as I said, to this ratio, the difference of the cross-sections with the opposite polarization divided by the sum. So here, the, the, the asymmetry is actually proportional to the structure function that contains a convolution of F1T perp, the Sievers function, and the unpolarized fragmentation function. So this is what I can have from the CD's point of view from the theory. Relian, so scattering of a proton on a nucleon target, polarized, and I get lepton anti-lepton or a lepton and a neutrino if I have a, a charge current. If I exchange, this is what you get if you exchange a photon or a Z, but if you exchange W plus or W minus, you have a neutrino instead of a, the second lepton. So you construct an asymmetry, again in this way, which is proportional to this ratio, 
and the asymmetry is actually a convolution between the Sievers function and the unpolarized Barton distribution function, not an unpolarized fragmentation function because you don't have a hedron in the final state but another hedron in the initial state. So the question had is, do we need a sign change between this Sievers function in the Relian and the Sievers function in semi inclusive DIS to describe simultaneously the asymmetries? This is what we need to understand. This is what we need to um, measure and this is what we need to try to uh, get from the experimental data. The need for having a minus sign or not between the Sievers function here and the Sievers function there, okay? So let's see, let's, have, let's, see, let's see briefly what the, what the current experiments can, can tell us. So maybe these plots are not super up to date, uh, but in my, I, to my knowledge, uh, there are, mm, I mean, this business is quite complicated. There are no recent results that improve the accuracy of what I'm showing you now. So this is a measurement in proton-proton collision from star, uh, char charge current relian because we have a W as an intermediate state. This is the Sievers asymmetry, which is measured in this particular kinematic. Okay, so this group here, Zhang Wei Chu and Zhongbo Kang, they extracted the Sievers function from uh, uh, analysis of uh, semi-inclusive DIS, and they tried to describe the asymmetry in relian by using two scenarios. The dashed, the dashed line is the Sievers, the Sievers TMD distribution without the sign change. So with a plus sign here. Okay. And the solid line is the Sievers, sign, the Sievers function with the sign change. So you see that the solid line, I mean, goes more or less across the data, whereas the other one does not. But can we claim that this is the first evidence of a sign change? Or, in other words, is the dashed curve incompatible with the data? What do you think? So how many, how many sigmas is the, how many standard deviations is the curve away from the data? So in the first point, both curves go through the, I mean, they intersect the error bar. So both curves are compatible. In the second and in the third one, in the second point, you are like two standard deviations away, and here it's by i something like 2.5 standard deviation. So it's not really that we can say that this is a first evidence of sign change, I, I think, because the curves are not really incompatible with the, with the data. So both scenarios are still there. On top of this, this calculation does not take into account, the calculation of this asymmetry, and so these two lines did not take into account the normalization of the PMDs. If you take into account the renormalization of the TMDs, this is what you get. So the prediction with the renormalized TMDs or with the TMD evolution equation is much, much smaller. So it's much closer to zero. So it's really inconclusive, okay? And so this is the central value only. If you look at the uncertainty of the calculation, so the, the green line is the prediction with the TMD, uh, with the evolved TMDs, the physical TMDs, and the dashed, so the, these uh, crossed uh, lines are, they the dashed area represents the uncertainty associated to that calculation. So you see that, I mean, there are still large errors on the experimental side and also on the theory side. So we need to work both in the theory side and the experimental side to reduce these uncertainties and try to make conclusive statements on this uh, sign change relation. Uh, Let's, let's switch to another experiment. Let's look what the COMPASS experiment has achieved. Um, so the COMPASS experiment is peculiar because they can measure both semi-inclusive DIS and RELIAN with the same apparatus. So this is nice because they can, I mean, you can work on the, uh, the systematics, uh, the experimental systematics in, 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 the, in the same way. I, I let my experimental colleagues uh, comment further on that. Um, but the bottom line is that they do same inclusive DIS and Relian in the same place with the same machine. Okay, so this is what you get for the Sievers asymmetry in semi inclusive DIS. The curves, so the points are the measurements, the curves are different extractions of the Sievers asymmetry and the Sievers function. Now they also measured, they also measured the Sievers asymmetry in Relian. This is a slightly outdated uh, plot, but I, I don't believe the new measurements add more to the precision. Um, 
So you see that they, with the free extractions of the Sievers function that you have here in semi inclusive DIS, um, they try to describe the Sievers asymmetry in Drelian. And this upper part here is what you get with the sign change scenario. And the lower part is what you get with the no sign change scenario. Obviously, they differ by a minus sign, but because the Sievers function, they change only by a minus sign. Uh, but you see that, as in the previous case, the uncertainties are still too big to make a conclusive statement. So, uh, from the theory point of view, we have a striking prediction, which is that one. It's a very important prediction. From the experimental point of view and the phenomenological point of view, we still have to do a lot of work to, uh, to get information on this. Okay, let me see how much time I have. Four minutes. All right. Okay, I want to now... Um, Okay, you know what? Let's stop here because I think this is quite important. And I, I, know I can also start from this slide, which is the second last slide. I only had one more slide on the chiral structures and the Collins function, but I can incorporate it in tomorrow's lecture. So let's, let's I would say, let's stop here on this uh, issue of the Sievers function changing its sign and the experimental measurements. And let's see if you have questions. <laughs>